connecting people, mission, and purpose to effect lasting change in their communities and the world. Doug Gilmer is doing just this. Let's hear a little bit about Doug. And I mean a little bit because there is so much. Doug has such an extensive career. Doug is a 35 plus year law enforcement veteran, a retired senior military leader, a PhD researcher, global consultant, trainer, author, and speaker on matters related to crime, such as human trafficking and child exploitation, national security, immigration, leadership, effective collaboration, and the intersection of faith, culture, and justice. I want to point out that Doug received the first ever DHS, that would be the Department of Homeland Security, everybody, Secretary's Award for Victim Protection and Human Trafficking, and a National Intelligence Medal for Intelligence Integration from the Director of National Intelligence, the website. And I am urging all of you, when we are done here, you run, not while we're talking, but when we're done here, uh, go to DougGilmer.com. Com, G I L M E R. You see Doug's name up there. We'll have everything in the body of the video, how to contact Doug. And you can also follow him. He's very active on LinkedIn, Douglas Gilmer, PhD. Welcome, Doug Gilmer, to the Warriors. Thank you. It's good to be here. And, well, and so people can also go to resolvedstrategies.com. Uh, no, we, which is, we didn't get there. We didn't get there yet, Doug, but go okay. ahead. Go ahead. I don't want to cut yeah, you so off. Re, so resolvedstrategies.com is the, is the, website for um, my company. Yes, we're getting there. We're getting there. All um, right. First, Doug, um, I want to thank on behalf of everybody, thank you for your service to our country. I want to say to you that you are a true life uh, warrior, really definitely a leader. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for protecting our country and being part of all of this. Um, you know, we, re we really want to honor you for this. You know, I want to say to you, we have a lot to discuss. We met in Washington a couple of weeks back. Uh, we were there and I couldn't wait. You know, when you gave me your card, I was like, oh, this is good. I can't wait to share Doug's voice and his expertise on everything, um, especially on slavery, which is what I call human trafficking in the United States. But first, uh, Doug, let's learn a little bit about you. Whatever you want to share about you, your background, you know, where'd you grow up? The floor is yours, whatever you, you want to share. Yeah, you know, I um, I grew up in Michigan, um, northern Michigan to be exact, and um, slowly kind of migrated my way south um, and, you know, began my career in local law, law enforcement, local and state law enforcement, uh, before moving to the federal government uh, in 1998. Uh, I began my career as a as a criminal investigator, as a special agent, uh, with what was then the Immigration and Naturalization Service, uh, prior to the creation of DHS, uh, and then finished out my career, um, you know, with within DHS at Homeland Security Investigations, and assigned to the the DHS Center for Countering Human Trafficking, where I I served as the senior law enforcement advisor and external liaison for the center. I, I have to ask you, Doug, why law enforcement? What was your attraction to law enforcement? You know, was it like something you thought about as a kid? Was it something that looked good, the overall package? Like, you know, like everything that comes with, you know, being like, really, I'm very curious what makes people tick. Why law enforcement? A tough job. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a long story, but I had I had some great mentors. Uh, my grandfather was a career law enforcement veteran, uh, actually retired um, from the U.S. Customs Service uh, as a special agent um, out of Detroit. Um, and so I, I kind of always had him. I had other other family in law enforcement and then some really good family friends um, in law enforcement that helped uh, mentor me and um you know without going into a lot of detail my my dad was killed when when i was growing up and oh, doug i'm very um, sorry sorry about that. the the support that i think i received from friends and co-workers of his um in law enforcement really kind of helped set the stage a foundation for me um, and I think 
two when I was when I was in high school. One one afternoon, I I watched a I watched a documentary on TV. I wasn't planning on watching this this documentary. Um, I actually my my plan was to watch the one o'clock movie on WKBD TV fifty out of Detroit, um, and hosted by a guy by the name of Bill Kennedy, um, who was actually the the voice of Superman. The, he he did the narration for the the Superman show, and I used to love to watch the you know the old like James Cagney movies you know that mm-hmm. kind of thing and but that day there was a there was a documentary on about the civil rights movement uh, in the South and I learned things watching that documentary that I had never learned about in school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I learned about, you know, we learned about Rosa Park. We learned about, um, you know, Martin Luther King. Um, and that was, that was about it. And so much of that documentary focused on, um, on Birmingham and Selma, Alabama and Montgomery. And I, I was really just blown away. And it, I think that was really kind of my first introduction to marginalized and vulnerable populations through that show. And I I knew, or through that documentary, and I I knew right then that this is what I was going to devote my life to. Um, And I I wanted to help people. And so I I knew from that moment on that that, this is what I was going to do. This was the trajectory that my life was going to take. Wow. I mean, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing about your dad also. But isn't it funny, Doug? It's even I, at an older age, um, am, have been doing so much research like about Vietnam, about civil rights, like because we, we get those textbook versions when we were kids that right. kind of glosses over everything and you're on to the next chapter. But I'm glad you pointed that out. But now we go back, we research. Obviously, we know we know more, you know, when we're older and things like that. Uh but that's that story is very interesting. To, that tells me it's meant to be, Doug. What yes. what happened to you? It's that's all. I, that's my opinion. It's it was meant to be. Uh, but we'll leave that for a second. Now I want to get your expert opinion. Believe it or not, Doug, you probably know this. What you know, what I know, the general public really doesn't understand or know. How would you describe the definition of human trafficking today in the United States? The landscape. What does human trafficking mean that we can break it down easily because we always want the public to understand what we're talking about. It is a crime of exploitation, mm-hmm. not transportation. So we we so often conflate human trafficking and human smuggling. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we conflate human trafficking with what's going on at the border particularly the the southwest border they're two very different things um sometimes there's some gray area sometimes there's there can be some overlap certainly a person's immigration status the situation that they're fleeing from that they're wanting to leave etc can make them vulnerable for trafficking but smuggling and trafficking are two two very different things. Smuggling is a crime of transportation. It's the movement of people. Human trafficking is a crime of exploitation, whether that is sexual exploitation or labor exploitation. Um, it it doesn't matter. It's a it's a crime against a person. And I think if if we need to begin thinking about this issue in that way. Um, that we we remove that the confusion between the border and and human trafficking because in in reality, the vast majority of sex trafficking victims that we encounter in the United States are U.S. citizens. They're people who were born and raised here, um, and now the majority probably of labor trafficking victims that we encounter are foreign nationals, but not all of them. 
I mean, there there are labor trafficking victims in the U.S. that look just like you and I. So it's um, it, it's no respecter of persons. It's no respecter of ethnicity, socioeconomic level. It, it doesn't matter where you go to school, what clothes you wear. It all trafficking boils down to the fact that a person has a vulnerability that can be exploited. And you're very, very nice, Doug, because I'm going to add it's about those horrible creeps and predators out there that can make a dollar off of somebody else. Uh, oh, you know, are absolutely right. I mean, human- people are like, Doug, I'm in the middle of New York City and people are like, oh, we don't understand, Lynn, why this happens. And I, I hate to be so crass, but the bottom line is because people can make money off of somebody else. Well, no, and you're you're exactly right. So human trafficking it's a financially motivated crime, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, we have human trafficking. We also have child exploitation, right? Sometimes there's some overlap, but again, two distinct crimes. Child exploitation is typically motivated by sexual gratification. Human trafficking is a financially motivated crime um, where traffickers can make a lot of money. Now, the the Johns or the those who by sex, obviously they're motivated uh, by sexual gratification. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the, it's, it's the fact that trafficking is able to make so much money. That's it. There, there's yeah. a, there's a constant there, there, there's always, there's always a demand. Um, and as long as there's a demand it, and people have money, disposable income, they're going to pay. You know, when you said Johns, it reminds me, I was in a meeting two days ago, Doug, here in New York, and they said we can no longer, and it was law enforcement, it was various people, uh, they said we can no longer in New York, we should we should not be using the word Johns, because it gives a stigma to Johns. Now, I, of course, burst out laughing. I was the only one that did laugh, but that's what we got to deal with. So, you know, those kind of things, picking apart names as opposed to let's really get down to business about the crime and the exploitation and how we're going to in- intervene and change it. Not, not calling somebody a, a, a John, but I want to ask you what I hear a lot of, uh, um, you know, different things out of law enforcement. I hear that trafficking now is, is bigger than drug trafficking. And then I sometimes hear, Oh, it's the number two crime. It's really drug trafficking. What's your take? What can you share with us about that? So, I mean, I, I, I think probably the best data that, that I've seen, I mean, it definitely shows where human trafficking has eclipsed the illicit arms trade um, mm-hmm. and, and trafficking has moved into two, at least the number two position. Um, there, there have been some discussions about human trafficking eclipsing the drug trade. I don't know that we're there quite yet. I think there were some estimates that said that by 2020, 2021, it might, I, I don't know that we've, we've gotten there, you know, quite yet because the, the drug trade continues to evolve, to evolve new drugs, fentanyl you know, that kind of thing, such a, such a high demand. Um, But there's, again, but there's a correlation between the drug trade and, and, and human trafficking as well. So um, I don't know that that human trafficking has necessarily eclipsed it, but it's, it's certainly, it's, it's certainly up there and our best, the, the best data that's, that's out there shows that the human trafficking globally uh, is about a three hundred and forty six billion dollar a year industry. You know what, Doug, you're the only one because I found one study with that figure that you just quoted because people are routinely using a much lesser amount I'll see on websites and things like that. And I've been sending this new figure to people like what what it is. Why? I have to ask you, why are studies? This is something I'm always railing about. Uh, why are the studies, in my opinion, this is why we need you now at Resolve Strategies, Doug, but I always find like the information is so lagging. It's always at least a couple of years behind these studies. Why can't we, with all the technology we have, right? 
why can't we have more current things happening? I, I never get this. When somebody gives me a study from 2014, forget it. That was a lifetime ago. We can't use those studies. So what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I mean, I and and I agree. I mean, the the previous figure that had been used was 150 billion, right? Always. And that that figure Always. was 10 or 12 years old. Um, you know, in in academic research, um, when when students are writing their thesis papers or their dissertations, you know, we we want sources, the the majority of sources, uh, within the last five years, um, so that it's it it's still relevant, right? So I, I think part of the issue, again, it boils down, oftentimes it boils down to money. A lot, of those money. A, a lot of those studies are funded. Oh, um, yeah. You know, re research requires money. You've got to pay people to do the research. You've got to pay people, you know, to travel, to, you know, to do whatever. Um, and they produce a product and that product is published, but there may not be funding for additional follow-up research or, or, or other relevant research in the subsequent years. So, and I think that's what it boils down to oftentimes. Yeah. Um, you know, the the most recent study, the, the 346 billion study, you know, that was, um, and, and kudos to them. This was published by NASDAQ um, right. and, and Verifin, um, who, again, shout out to them. I have no formal relationship with them, but they've, NASDAQ and Verifin, their, their partner organization, have taken a very strong stance uh, on this issue. And um, Adina Friedman, the, the, the chairwoman of NASDAQ, had an opportunity a few years ago to, to meet a survivor of human trafficking, and it, it changed her outlook on this issue. And she recognized the fact that they were sitting on a vast amount of financial data and said, we we need to do something. We we need to lead change in this area. Um, and so that's that's what they've started to do. And obviously they've they've got the resources and the capital right. to be able to to put a, a product like this together absent you know government funding. Yeah, I, I just when I saw this, I couldn't believe it. And when I I you know put it on Twitter. X, whatever it's called now, Doug, I'll call it Twitter. People actually questioned me. I said, no, this isn't from me. I, I posted the link to this. And fast forward a couple of people, I, I said, you know, you might want to change your website. People I know, I, I just didn't mm -hmm. attack people and say change. And they still to this day haven't changed anything. So I, right. I, I, I don't know, but I'm going to put a link to that in the body of this video um, so everybody can read that for themselves. Before we jump into resolve strategies, Break down. What's a special agent? I know somebody's going to ask me that, so I'm asking you first. They're going to say, "What exactly does that mean, a special agent?" So, a special agent uh, is a criminal investigator. Um, you know, with within my circles, um, it's you know, it's it, it's a federal agent, federal law enforcement officer. I mean, there states oftentimes have special agents too at the you know state level. Um, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation, their their personnel are called special agents as well, but uh, they're criminal investigators. Um, they're um, they're they're typically the ones that receive tips, receive information, um, or are called to follow up on serious crimes or serious investigations. Okay, now I must ask you, Doug. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work and interviews and different things about Sean Combs, mm -hmm. a.k.a. Diddy. I like to call him Sean Combs as one I've started in the music business many decades ago. Uh, what do you have to say about this whole case? I am I, My bottom line is, I'll just share with you, um, I want to see justice for the victims because so so many times they they will not come forward, do not come forward. What's the use? Nobody believes them. This could really be a turning point, in my opinion. We've heard about it for decades, right? I told people, go to the police, go in law enforcement, go to hospital emergency rooms, make sure you have reports. Nobody did anything until now, right? What What do you take as an expert surrounded by all of this, you know, for decades? What do you think about all this? So, um, you know, 
shout out to the agency that I just retired from, Homeland Security Investigations, because we, um, it's it's HSI that's that started that investigation is leading that investigation, uh, just as we did the R. Kelly case, you know, from from a couple of years ago, um, and a, a lot of very dedicated agents, uh, victims assistance personnel, um, and others you know, working, working this investigation. But I think really, Lynn, it all goes back to what you just said. And the, and the key word is the victims. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we all want to see justice served, um, in, in this case, we want to see the people who were responsible for facilitating the exploitation of, of people held accountable. But I, I, we also have to be careful, right? Because there are these big cases, P. Diddy, R. Kelly, um, you know, Epstein from, you know, from a few years ago that tend to get all the headlines. Yes. And we, we focus on those because these, these are the cases, right, that are going to show up in some form, one way or the other, next season, two seasons from now on Law, Law and Order SVU, right? Um, we're gonna we're we're gonna see these things replayed. Um, I think the important thing is that there are so many more victims of human trafficking yes. than those represented in P Diddy, R Kelly, Epstein, etc. Um, I, I know. I mean, just last year, uh, you know, Homeland Security Investigations, just one agency, um, mind you, the the lead federal law enforcement agency for investigating human trafficking. But I mean, just our just our agents alone identified and provided services to almost eight hundred human trafficking victims last year. Um, and so, and, and that's, that's a drop in the bucket, right? Yeah. Because we know that, you know, best case, only one, one in 10, maybe, maybe two in 10, but probably one in 10 or less, depending on what data you look at, victims are ever, ever identified. Um, and so we're we're missing a, a huge we're, we're we're missing a huge population um, of victims, and we're doing the best we can to identify those that we come across, those that we identify through the course of investigations and and that kind of thing. Um, but it's you know it's a, it's a crime that occurs in the shadows, right? And you know, and when we and again back to back to p diddy and to r kelly that's just sex trafficking there's far more labor trafficking that's yeah. taking place in the united states than there is sex trafficking and but we don't we don't think about it we don't recognize it as easily because one we don't have stereotypes we all have stereotypes of what a, tra a sex trafficking victim may look like, right? Because we we've, we've been brought up on stereotypes through the media, through TV and movies, and and that kind of thing. We don't really have that for labor trafficking, and in labor trafficking, more often than not, it looks just like somebody going to work. Right. We don't know the backstory. Uh, we don't know the conditions under which that person is working, and so it's very hard hard to detect um and it's overlooked and although the trauma may be different between sex trafficking and labor trafficking there is victims of labor trafficking still are subject to a lot of trauma um again it it, it may be different uh, between the two but it's it's there nonetheless yeah, and I just um, know with our experiences here, you know, anybody labor trafficked for the most part, Doug, they don't want, like they want to make whatever little bit of money that is or something. They're so scared. They don't 
ever really want to come forward. I mean, it's bad enough with sex trafficking, but right. labor, they just want to be quiet, kind of disappear into the scene kind of thing and not start all of that. But I agree. I'm always asking, um, especially here in New York, why aren't we equally working on um, labor trafficking kind of thing? Again, it comes down to those those dollars, I hear the same story, Doug, you know, resources, uh, manpower, I'm supposed to say woman power too now, Doug. So man and woman power, um, you know, I live in New York. They, they throw these things at me, like, make sure you say like Lynn, I'm like, okay, I'll say woman power too, whatever. Um, but what a shame, right? Because as you, you very well know, everything is just escalating and, and getting worse. Yeah. And I don't understand why all of this is not a priority. And I know that sounds very like elementary, Doug, basic. Why isn't this more of a priority? I know it is. I know a lot of people are talking about it. There's lots of nonprofits now, organizations, you know, individuals working on all of this. But I would think this would be really at the top of the list because look at what all of this feeds into, right? You know, it's that right. wheel. I like, to, I like to say it's a wheel with a lot of spokes. So whether it's the border feeding into sex and labor trafficking, feeding into, you know, unaccompanied minors. We don't seem to know where they are in this country. The organized crime rings. We've got these cartels. You know all this, Doug. They're working yeah. in every state. They're trafficking American kids to sell the drugs in middle and high schools and uh, to traffic their peers. Why? And I mean, answer any way you see fit or don't answer, but like, I don't understand why it's not a top priority, like a really top priority. I that's a good it. question. That, that, that's a good question. I don't, I don't, you don't even have to have an answer. I just, I keep talking yeah. about it because no, I don't I, understand I, it. Like these I, are our precious I kids. I don't, under, I don't understand it either. And I mean, you only have to, and, and you and I aren't the only ones that are asking that, asking right. that same question. I mean, it, it wasn't that long ago when, um, you know, Tim Tebow and Jim Cole, who is another retired HSI special agent, who um, a, another warrior in this area, he, his career focused primarily on child exploitation. But they appeared before Congress and asked the right. same question very directly. And I mean, we spend we only spend about one percent on this issue compared to the amount of money spent on the war on drugs. There is such a huge delta, such a huge, such a, a, a stark contrast uh, between those, those two pots of money. We're, I think we're, we're starting to, we're, we're investing more, um, you know, from, from the government. And, and I think the numbers of cases, investigations, convictions, that kind of thing are, are going up. We're seeing more labor trafficking cases prosecuted. Um, there are, are some jurisdictions that are, are being very innovative with it. There are some folks within the LA County District Attorney's Office that are, are really kind of thinking outside the box on prosecuting these cases and working with the federal government to move these cases forward. So there there is some momentum, but on, until, I, I really, I, I think until Congress, um, really starts to put their money where their mouth is, um, so to speak, um, and really begins to make the, the the sizable investments that are needed to, um, you know, to do this work. It's never going to be taking, it's never going to be taken as seriously. Doug, I'm, I'm trying to sit still in my chair. When I hear the word Congress, I think of them as a debate team. This is just me that wants to get on Fox News and CNN and talk. And then the issue goes away after a day or two. And for the most part, because we do have some good things happening, like Kids Online Safety Act. We're Absolutely. slowly, you know, the pendulum is, I don't want to be such a Debbie Downer here. You know, the pendulum is slightly swinging, as you pointed out, on Kids Online Safety Act. But come on now, they work for us. I don't get it. They got to move faster. You know, this is, this is priority. This is crisis in America. This is families, kids, and everything else that's involved. But uh, don't get me started on them, Doug. No, but at least- and, 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 <laughs> They and, have to and move you, it along. Right. And, but at least, 
you and I and, and you and I have seen this. We, we saw this a couple of weeks ago. There is. There is bipartisan support which I think we would all agree this this should not be a partisan issue. We should not be arguing um, whether or not to protect people, especially children, right. from exploitation. This, this, this shouldn't be a Republican issue or a Democratic issue. Um, this should be something everybody can agree to work on together. Well, you would think so. <laughs> you would think you it would, would think just so. be, you would just think it would be uh, that's for another program. We'll leave it for that. Now we've got to get into um, we've got to get into resolve strategies. I'm so glad you are doing this. You formed this, Doug, you, uh, bringing all your expertise. We we need you in New York. I'm putting that right out there. Um, tell us, tell us all. You know, first of all, after decades of working between law enforcement and 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 all of this trafficking, and it's a very very heavy thing. How do you take care of yourself? I'm, I'm very serious about that because it's all very disturbing. If I ever just stop for a second, and I certainly have not been involved anywhere near your level. If I start thinking about one thing, I could get all sidetracked because it's so disturbing. So you, I keep going. But how do you take care of yourself? It's a very important thing. It is. Um, and this is actually a difficult question don't feel compelled answer. like you have to answer anything. I no, don't want to put no, you on the spot. I, no, I just, I, I, it's, I'm always it's, concerned it's, about it's, people taking right, care of themselves. It's it's difficult for me to answer because I failed at this for so long. You failed. Um, I, I I didn't I didn't take good care of myself. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I I could have I could have done much better. Let's just say that at, at at taking taking care of myself, my mental health, um, and because I've I've seen and experienced a lot throughout thirty five right. years, um, I have healthier ways to cope now, and and healthier ways to to you know to deal with things, whether it's, um. You know whether it's it's exercise. I I love being outdoors. I love oh, I love now. I mean now that I'm retired, um, I have much more time to go fishing. I, I fish almost every day, which is a great form of relaxation for me. Um, and and people laugh at this, um, but I I have I have found out that I am not the only one, um, that feels this way. But for me, one of the best forms of therapy is pulling weeds. Guess what? It is so therapeutic to be out in the dirt. Yeah. And then actually pulling a weed or planting a flower. And there's that sense of accomplishment. And it's mindless. Like you can just do it. I can't yeah, believe you I said can, that. I just talked to somebody, Doug, yesterday about that last night. Yeah, I can I can literally go outside and I can completely lose myself. Good. Uh pulling weeds. Um, and I, I often joke with people, you know, like if you've got weeds to pull, call me, I'll come do it. Um, 1-800 you know, call Doug for weeds. It's a, a side business for you. No, but yeah, you know exactly. what? That That's a really beautiful thing. Cause we're always recommending, you know, get out with nature. Just, just, just get out. It's like mindless, but there's also, and you probably have a great lawn or whatever. Cause you got rid yeah. of all the weeds on top of it. So, wow. Well, I mean, thank you for sharing that, but it's about, it's hard to step away. It's hard to, we just keep going, we go, go, go. And uh, yeah. I like that. I'm going to steal that. And now I'm going to tell everybody, just don't get outside. Doug Gilmer says, go out and pull weeds and beautify properties. That's even better exactly. if you don't mind. Now tell us, so now you retired, even though you're mm -hmm. a baby, you retired, you went right into forming Resolve Strategies. Tell us about the company. Tell us what the mission statement is and what you want to do with resolve strategies. So the term resolved means that the textbook definition means to be firmly determined to do something. That's that's the definition of resolved. And we more or less know what strategies are. Um, specific plans to accomplish a goal or an end. 
what I have found over over my career, and especially a career working, you know, human trafficking and uh, you know those types of things. There are a lot of organizations, there are agencies, there are states, there are nonprofits, NGOs that all say that they're firmly determined to do something. They just have no idea what they're doing, how to get there, how to deliver results, um, how to form relationships, how to collaborate. And if you, and for some of those organizations, they can't answer the basic question as to why. Now, I mean, they can give the 10,000 foot answer. Well, we want to we want to end human trafficking globally, right? But they they can't put together they they can't identify their core values. They can't avi- identify their their mission statement, their vision statement. And if you can't do that, if you can't do those things, you're just going to continue to run in circles. You're you're never going to be able to get to where you want to be and deliver the results that you ultimately want to deliver as an organization. So, you know, building on my 35 years, um, the the relationships that that I have established with other successful NGOs and nonprofits around the country, relationships within government, the financial sector, um, the the tech industry, um, and and so forth. Really, what we do, and 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 again, with a lot of survivor input um, into Thank into you. what we Thank do. You. Much um, needed has to be. And um, you know, I've got a, a, a great core group of survivors that that are are involved in this effort with me, um, both male and female. Um, being able to connect or being able to provide the the training resources um access to technology and and those types of things that organizations need uh, in order to be able to collaborate collaborate effectively and deliver the results that they intend um the outcomes that they need and it, collaboration is very essential to to everything that we do um i yeah. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the outcomes of c- collaboration in the human trafficking arena and uh, in, encountering human trafficking, what those outcomes look like. And I learned a lot uh, from from doing that research and, and doing interviews and focus groups around the country. And so being able to take all of those resources and being able to advise and consult with organizations um, really kind of across the country um, and make them better. At, at what they're doing um, and getting them to the point where they can actually be successful in delivering results uh, and delivering the outcomes that they hope to uh, that they hope to achieve. Sometimes that's a matter of helping them to identify what their mission purpose or the, what their mission yes. or purpose is. Sometimes it's a matter of just helping them bridge those gaps and build relationships. If they're an NGO, a nonprofit, helping them build those relationships with law enforcement. What does that look like? Or or meeting with both law enforcement and NGOs and helping them to, um, you know, to, to form those to form those initial relationships upon which they can build trust and effectively collaborate um, for good. Doug, it is so needed. It is so I I do do you teach hard work and passion, by the way, <laughs> because I, <laughs> I, I, I say that kiddingly, but not really. Um, you know, I when I started doing this, and just because I can't help myself, Doug, like I have to do this now. Like I can't, I just have to do it. Working in this arena, spreading word, sharing expert right. voices. We do a lot of work behind the scenes with survivors. We don't put any of that online or anything like that. A lot of what we do is private. But I was shocked that, I have to be honest with you, I thought so many people I've encountered really lack that true passion. And in my mind, I would call them kind of like nine to fivers. And a lot of the people I'm talking about are in New York where I'm based, right? Where I have like a lot of access and coalition meetings and things. And I'd be like, how can you not have more passion towards this subject? Um, I'm glad you mentioned survivors. I think survivors need to be at the table for all of this, right? I've never been trafficked. No, I've never been trafficked. Right. And so 
what gives me the right to even speak about any of it unless I collaborate with those who have, who can teach me, right? right. And, and, and be part of it and include them. So I think overall, we have to be better with survivors. We have to be able to monetize them better, like help them better. You know, here in New York, they give them a gift card to Target. Like that is not good enough. <laughs> you know, so right. we've got that whole thing going on there. I like that you brought up, um, we also need more men. Men are trafficked. People don't talk about it a lot. Men don't come they forward. Don't. You know, they're embarrassed. But we need also men and, and, and you know, teen boys. And, and we're starting to see like sextortion and things. Some teens are stepping up with the parents and all that. But we definitely, I was in a meeting two days ago and I finally said at the end, like we need more men to join us uh, as we discuss something here in New York called the equality model, you know, to yep. come to the table to support not only women and girls, because it's always, you know, a bunch of women sitting around. We've got to really bring that male voice and, and seek them out. They'll come if, if we right. find them and train them kind of thing. They're there. You know, it's kind of met with blank stares. And um, but I also think people really do, Doug, go into this with good intentions. Either something happened directly to them, somebody they know, they want to really help. It is so large, dark and ugly and overwhelming. Like they don't know where to go with all of it. Like, so they don't right. know how to have a mission statement. They're afraid to really collaborate. And I have to point out with the collaboration, I'm the biggest collaborator in the world. It's not always that welcoming, Doug. Seriously, they don't, everybody's kind of in that little silo thing to use that right. word. I don't know if they're afraid of, um, like any other business, you know, it's about raising money. So they stay to themselves. If I, I don't know, I have to collaborate. I need your voice. I'm not law enforcement. I don't have your experience. All you, you know, nurses unite against human trafficking. I work with, I don't, I'm not a nurse, uh, you know, survivors. Right. We have to, as you pointed out, this is why we need resolve strategies. We need you to be the leader. I, I mean this, Doug. Really, storm the it's, United States and whip all these organizations into into shape. It's it's about building shared purpose. Yeah. Um. At 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 the end of the day, that is that is the nuts and bolts of. That's the nuts and bolts of collaboration, right? It's, um, and there's a big difference between participation, cooperation, and collaboration. Um. And, you know, cooperation at its, at its source is really a selfish motivation, not, not negative, not, not bad selfish, right? You, we can cooperate, but if I ask you to cooperate with me, I'm, I'm asking you to help me achieve something that I want to achieve really um, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a selfish motivation. Again, it might be a great idea, but at the end of the day, you're helping me achieve something I want to achieve. If we collaborate, your goals become my goals, my goals become your goals. Um, and that's that's shared purpose. Um, and but you're right, we we tend to get um we tend to work in silos. Um Unfortunately, a lot of that is because, at least on the the nonprofit side, um, yeah. is the competition over resources. Everybody's competing for the same same pots of money. There are only so many federal grant organizations, whether it's um, the Office of Trafficking and Persons or DHS or DOJ or NIJ or, or whoever, there are only so many of those and the pot of money is only so big and you've got so many organizations that are out there that everybody's competing for the same the same pots of money. It's the same way in human trafficking research at the university level. Um, everybody's, all those universities that are doing research in human trafficking, they're not really collaborating with one another because they feel like they're having to protect their intellectual property um when applying for these grants because they need those grants in order to do the research um and so there's there is this competition aspect right. um we, we we need to solve that we need we need to be able to solve the funding the, the funding aspect um and 
you know, a, a conversation for another time, but there's a group of us that are doing that. Um, oh, I, I would love, I would love to see in a couple of years, the, the need for the, these federal grants to be done with, um, and, and to have enough private sector money, uh, to be able to fund a lot of these efforts without having to rely on the federal government, because it just, it, it, it breeds that, it, it breeds that competition that's not helpful to the to the overall end goal. You know, in law enforcement, we're very we're we're typically very stat driven, um, and everybody wants you know everybody wants the media release and and you know that type of thing. Um, you know, and they have to please the mayor, and the mayor has to you know yeah. please the city council, and so there are a lot of different factors. Um, that that come to play that can inhibit collaboration. But I think when people see the the outcomes of collaboration and what collaboration can actually achieve, they're willing to put those other things aside and work together. And when people work together, they achieve far more than they ever could otherwise. I mean, absolutely. I you know, in my dream world, Doug, you know, I want more companies, something I do behind the scenes, I, I will be doing more of it. You know, I want more companies to step up, you know, as part of their overall plan, right? Right. Like we're going to, we're, we're going to have more exactly human trafficking because I'm finding lately, well, here in New York, at least, you know, so domestic violence, that kind of came onto the scene. I don't know when, could have been like 30 years ago. Remember, it, it, nobody talked about domestic violence and then that kind of became its own category here in New York, they're folding like the human trafficking right now into the domestic violence, like all together, which we right. know they intersect. We know all that, but I want to see like more actual separation of like human trafficking really standing by itself. It seems like it might be here in New York. It is not, it's folded in kind of thing. And I, I want to see companies really step up. I don't know how that's enforced you know, it's part of their their program, you know, taking on survivors for training kind of. Right. I, I don't know how we can like I'd like to see the government. I don't I can't tell people what to do, but like go in that direction, you know, really helping society. So not just even giving monies out, like help people have job training so they can do something and not depend on trafficking, you know, for a hamburger, right. or the, the money. Oh, so like yeah. the, like more of those human interests is the way I see all of this going. Um because be, the, I feel like I have to just say this to you, Doug, I feel like in the government, they just check off the boxes every year, give the same people. It's easy for them, right? Maybe, I don't know, to give the same people money. And then we don't get into the new thinking, the new ways, as you said earlier, like thinking, we have to think out of the box about all of this. We have, because those predators are 20 steps ahead of everybody. They've like right. figured out like, right. And we didn't even get to touch upon, uh, AI today and online, um, which I'd love, Doug, I want you to come back more often on the Warriors to explain different things. I want to get into more tech and the integration of all that. I want to get into, I want to talk about resources and companies and things like that. I'm glad to hear you're working on different ways of, of, of monies for all of this, but finish us up. The American public right now, you know, we do what we focus the Warriors on America right here, right? We know it's a global crime. It's it intersects, right? We know servers are in other countries and all that. But let let us reassure the public right now listening. What what do you want them to know about and focus on? Because the other thing is, I'm so afraid it happens because it is so dark and ugly and overwhelming. They just shut the door to it. People don't want to mm -hmm. know. So we try to always have like a take action, something easy lifting for people because we need everybody on board. I firmly believe 2024 going forward, this is everybody's responsibility, our children, our families, society, culture, morals, right? <laughs> um, what do you want to tell everybody? Get educated. Mm -hmm. um, and Put out of your mind the the stereotypes that that you've been accustomed to seeing in the media, um, because it's they're they're just that they're stereotypes. They're they're not. It's it's often not reality. So get educated to the facts. Go to dhs.gov/backslash/blue campaign. 
um, and learn about it and, and learn about it in a way that's not going to be traumatic, triggering, you know, mm -hmm. anything like that, but, but learn, learn the facts about what human trafficking is and then get involved somehow. Um, you don't, you don't necessarily have to, to give a ton of money or anything like that, but maybe even find a way to volunteer. Go go sit in one of your community's you know, human trafficking task force meetings, um, you know, the, the sessions that are open to community members. Um, find out who else is involved in this. Find out ways that that you can get involved even, even at a small level. Something that you may think is insignificant may not really be all that insignificant. So um, just find a way to get involved. And and I tell people all the time, and this is kind of my, this is kind of my, the the, the thing that motivates me in and out every day. Um, it's, it's tattooed on the inside of my arm. Uh, and it's a, it's a verse uh, from Proverbs in the Bible, uh, Proverbs 21, 15, where it says, it is a joy for the just to do justice yeah, and you will never find and you you will never experience greater joy than you do when you help another person when you help another vulnerable marginalized person find justice for themselves for their perpetrator whatever the case might be if if you truly if 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 you truly want to want to experience joy something that's not subject to external influence um you know based upon how you're feeling that day um if you if you want want to experience true joy not just happiness but true joy serve another person selflessly serve another person um and and you'll see the joy that comes out of doing what we do in this line of work and and it's it's what has driven me all of these years Doug those that's great final words you know I kept you longer than I said but promise me Doug you'll come back like you know we need to talk more often there's so many different things we need to stress upon. I will have um, links to everything. You know, I even put DHS, I put the fentanyl awareness, I put everything in the body of the video. Uh, we have to talk about that even more. Yep. And I really, you know, I just have to say amen to you. I mean, God bless you, Doug. This is uh, tremendous. And Resolved Strategies is exactly what is needed to begin to really change the landscape, to begin the collaborations. I envision, you obviously are envisioning it, envisioning the same kind of things I think about. And Absolutely. always, I like Doug, you pointed out, even if somebody just shares information, if that's all they can do, you know, something you post, right? That's right. well vetted. It's good. It's a study. It's information, you know, firsthand, that's good enough, right? It's not always about money. Of course, we all know about money, but um, it's just yeah, every, and you don't... every little thing about this subject, right? Helps. Right. And it's not about, and, and not only is it not just about money, it's also not about going and kicking in doors and 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 pulling people out of an exploitative situation and that kind of thing. You 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 don't you don't have to be in law enforcement to make a difference. I was just thinking about something because a lot of people will say to me, Oh, Linda, you go and 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 rescue children. And that is something, Doug. No, I don't do that. I I that's not my job. I'm not in law enforcement. I'm not storming places. You know, there's a lot of that kind of, oh, that's for another show. We'll talk about it. Doug Gilmer, I want to thank you. I'm going to thank you again. I'm going to keep thanking you for joining us today, taking the time. Um, I'm going to hold you to, you're going to be coming back much more often to talk about Absolutely. different things. Um, I, I thank you. We thank, I'm thanking on behalf of everybody Truly, please stay safe, be well. Again, I'll have all of your information will be about Resolve Strategies. Everything about you will be in the body of the video. We'll be urging the warriors, we'll be urging and supporting you and urging people contact you. Um, to, to I want you to whip them into shape, all right? They need the whipping. In. <laughs> Whipping's not a good word. I shouldn't say that. I want you, I want you to... <laughs> you know, structure them to mold help them. them. Yeah. Yes. Mold them because we need everybody. 
And I mean that like the bodies, we need everybody and everybody to work on this so we can begin to really, you know, overcome, right? Human trafficking yep. is, here. Doug, it's here to stay. It's not like yep. you can end it, but we can, you know, intervene to prevent new victims and try to solve what's out there. So I just want to tell you again, Doug Gilmer, thank you. You truly are a warrior. Let's speak again soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, Doug.